I just wanted to start by reminding us that the objective of the conference is to provide an open forum to enable stakeholders to exchange ideas and discuss the modernization of European railways by leveraging ICT with a key focus on enhancing interoperability of cross-border railway business and the business applications in particular to passenger and freight infrastructure. The conference is facilitated by HITRAIL, the non-profit railway intercommunications company. Created in 1989, that's when I first came to this place, so it's been going a while then, and owned by 12 European railway undertakings and infrastructure and managers. Those of you who follow the goings on the proceedings of the European Parliament will be well aware that the constant complaint is the word I would use from members of the European Parliament, but you very rarely gave us one reason why you can do something. So this is the ideal opportunity now for us to find that one reason why we can do something and facilitate railways, particularly crossing borders and the use of technology to get us to that particular goal and, and aim. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning uh, everybody. So I thought there would be an introduction on the content, but I see that I need to do it myself, so I'm the lead contact and uh, the technology, so it's a bit uh, difficult for me. I, my intention was to, to give a little bit of a background why, why in fact, is the Commission uh, taking an initiative in this field, which should be uh, a challenge, in fact. So, uh, certainly, interoperability, innovation, uh, and the aspects of cooperation. And then, uh, I will give some priorities on what is our intentions uh, in, the coming, uh, sorry, in the coming years. So, first of all, uh, just on fact and, and figure, to note that, uh, I'm doing it, but everybody knows already that these are the figures of 2009 concerning the share of the, of the different <coughs> modes of transport. And for goods, uh, it's, it's 10%, as you can see uh, in red. For passenger, it was uh, 6.2. Uh, so it's really, it's really uh, a, 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 short, a short figure. And if we take the greenhouse gas emissions, so it's uh, 0.7. What does it mean? And this is the considerations uh, that are made in the, in the white uh, paper that we just adopted before. It means that rain, in fact, could really play a bigger role uh, in, the, in the chain uh, of transport. Two roles where you need to be uh, highly diplomatic one is the Secretary General of the United Nations, and the other is the Chief Executive of the Committee of, the, uh, Committee of European Railways. But, leave on the floor. So we are 
cooperating rules on a daily basis uh, with the European Commission, European Parliament. We also try to, to keep in touch uh, with the permanent representations, so in a, say, and indirectly with the Council of the European Union related to the safety management system because interoperability goes hand in hand with the safety. Uh, we are also involved in the corridor issues, so we of course follow very closely the local railway as a transport uh, network, not just the national. This is where we uh, not only discuss with the members, but also we, we can challenge uh, the communities to go in that direction, which is not always very easy as you know, because we have a very nationalistic approach. That's a good mistake. <laughs> Anyway, so what, what with, where we are today, I mean, it's, it's probably uh, good to say that we are not starting from a scratch when talking about uh, the IT applications. We, we have a lot of them already developed and well, used. Let's go for coffee and we'll be back at 10 past 11 with Kai. Uh, Kai Branson will be uh, uh, speaking to us, followed by Josemia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, very. Sorry, 25 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, so 15 minutes. So, I have divided my presentation in three uh, parts. First, I will tell a couple of words about Europe and Railway Agency. Then, how is railway legislation? Uh, is affecting the rail sector is, is developed and then uh, I try to uh, give some examples of interoperability in railways and in, especially in this IT context. So as you see European Railway Agency is in the bottom of this slide uh, among the agencies so agencies are European Union bodies among others, these agencies from 30 different agencies in different uh, member states. ERA is the agency for railway uh, subjects situated in France and Brazil. And uh, our main tasks are uh, to make recommendations to the Commission for Rail Legislation, other regulations for discussion rights, uh, and application regulation and the agency regulation. This gives surely the base for our work. That the railway undertakings are not allowed to make better recommendations or better solutions <coughs> required by the legislation. It's not said so. If the railway undertakings in particular make a better so uh, include uh, before and uh, during the journey information, reservations, payment systems, luggage management, and management of connections between place and other modes of transport. So it is a must according to the interoperability that we have also, we have been of some from the personal innovation director and a company called Atos. Let me first start my speech with an important event that's happening next year. Next year will be 2012, which is just an ordinary year for many of you, but it will be the 150th anniversary of something that happened in 1862. In 1862, a guy called Abraham Lincoln signed the PRA, the Pacific Railroad Act, in which he said, we have to build a railroad linking together the west coast and the east coast of the United States. The idea was not only logistics, it was we have a distributed union and the train will help us to link our citizens. The train will help us to unite our citizens. It was more a political action than a logistic action. 150 years later, we have another union here, this part of the world. Well, at us. Ados, 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 we are 80,000 people that many of you may not know us. Actually, I have serious problems with being known, especially when I go to my daughter's school. And the nine-year-old girl told me, you work in an IT? Yes, I am. What kind of video games do you do? <laughs> so, well, uh, you don't do any video games, actually. And her answer was then, 
what do you work for? <laughs> it's actually in Spanish has two meanings. Es muy work for, para que trabajas, es, why do you work? <laughs> so, it's true, if I don't do the event, why do I work? <laughs> so, let me let, let me tell you who Atos is. We are, well, we are those guys. We are a merger of what used to be called as Atos Origin until June, and what used to be called Siemens IT Services until June, and now we are together. We are almost 8,000, 8, 17, 4,000. This is the place in 42 countries, <coughs> and, uh, and well, we are, uh, it's not all Siemens, it's just Siemens IT Services, 30,000 people who emerged us. 30,000 people is not in the same age. So now we are much better than we used to be. Um, our chairman is former Minister of the Economy in France, Thierry Breton, and as he says, we strive to create a firm of the future, and we believe that we have to put together technology and business. That's our light. way to transport. Operations should be coordinated in advancing communication and IT and culture. Else, we are in serious trouble. <laughs> a very good future ahead. There's a very good future ahead. And we have to do it in a lean way, economically and Political interview, and that can be a key part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josma. I'm amazed you managed to get Antonio Lopez, who is the managing director of, of HipRail, and uh, um, Antonio will speak till 12:20, just because we're a little earlier. I'm not going to give any extra time. So, Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First thing I'm going to try is to... Okay, can we respond in railway fashion to that? <laughs> it means the line's now clear all the way to uh, Luxembourg. Okay, the intention today for my presentation is to explain a little bit Hitrail as a company. We have been acting in the, in the global environment for the last 21 years. A little bit of the history and a little bit of the future, basically. To manage the international railway uh, network called Hermes on behalf of uh, the stakeholders and the customers. It's a company which is a non-profit non -profit making company, a neutral company, with a strong management team and a vast knowledge of a railway environment. We have been for the last 21 years, for the past 21 years, very active in, in the community of railways. And in this year, we have been able to build, to stitch in building and coordinating complex projects, complex technological projects like the MS, uh, migration of IT and other, other projects. And we have been for the for these years in the vanguard of data communications, the network. But uh, isn't it more possible to have the customer earlier in the process of the, the, the working group? Sorry. Unfortunately our, our agency regulation defines uh, partner speech uh, must be taken into account in our development. But through this uh, sector of organizations <coughs> and the knowledge of the uh, era project officers we surely put the source of the customer on when we are developing meetings. We check with the customers that their needs has to be taken into account in our work. So we keep in our minds the customer from the beginning, but the uh, official checking will be done in the end of the process. Uh, just 
so at the moment, we've got all this legislation to implement, and we both Brown and the uh, Brown IRUs and IMs. We seem to have a few economic problems just at the moment, but you may have heard about them. Um, how, really? I know it's a directive, and I know it's law, but how does anybody argue it should be, this should be done rather than other basic... Uh, law. But first of all, if you're relying on my pocket, then it's very wise not to do that. Um, <laughs> Um, look, I mean, we've had this issue on, on other, um, in other modes of transport. I'll give you a classic example, the implementation of the ETS scheme in civil aviation, um, where the airlines come back and say, well, look, is this the right time to be doing it? You know, we're suffering. With, and I always, I've found this, since I've been on this transport committee since 1989, every time you introduce something new, Transport operators come, it's always Armageddon tomorrow, you know, the world will end tomorrow because you've introduced this, 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 and of course, the world carries on. And I think what we would say is that the regulations, the, there's a kind of feeling out there, I think, amongst industry in particular, that I'm spending my spare time at the weekends not watching my beloved Wigan Warriors, but I'm sat in the stands at the Wigan Warriors game thinking, what more, le any more legislation I can introduce to hit these bastards in the railways? Eh? <laughs> um, and let, I, I, let me tell you, that doesn't happen. And as I I interjected on one of the speakers, I don't know if it was Kai, uh, when I said, well, uh, um, actually, implementation of existing legislation would be a good start, as opposed to introducing new legislation. And we in the Parliament firmly believe that. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is not a cop-out for you guys to then say, poor rack, we don't have to do anything now for three, four, five, ten years, or, or whatever. Doesn't matter what you think, that's the law. And the member states have signed up to it. Our biggest problem, we think, in the in the European Parliament is member states sign up to things without any intention of implementing them. And we think that's dishonest. And so you will always get a hard view from Parliament we should implement, not because we want to squeeze the pits of the railway companies till they squeak, but because that's what we've done our work have done their work, it now needs to, the Commission to do theirs and ensure that implementation uh, is, is complete. You know, we could have done things a lot quicker 15 years ago when there wasn't a financial crisis, but there's always other priorities. And one of the problems in transport is you've always got to be battling against the schools and the hospitals and, and what have you. And I always say as well, one of the problems with transport is normally transport ministers are either going up the greasy pole or coming down the greasy pole. And you never get a transport minister who's at the top of the, of the greasy pole. Nearest, probably, we had a couple of years ago, we had the deputy prime minister. But that's about, you know, the getting transport a higher political profile within, within government and within, uh, you know, what... And I don't think as transport people, we have actually sold what we can do for the economy and what we can do for social inclusion. We've tended in the past to stick in our modes, we'll run the trains, we'll run the plane, and we've never argued until recently because of the downturn, we've never argued what the economic uh, potential of transport is to regions, what the social inclusion potential is, what our cost-benefit ratio is in investing in transport. We've always, we've ignored that and I think we've got to start doing that. So